Wendy here. This is my next, uh, I think I'm wearing almost the exact, no, different t-shirt. Week two. The podcast episode went out this morning and it is on the subject of consent. And I had a lovely conversation with a woman named Erica Scott, who's just written a book called Creating Consent Culture. And it's a book written for educators. Sounds absolutely amazing. The newsletter that went out on Monday morning was titled with the theme of useless slash useful. And so what I think I'll try to do for the next little while is round out my underbelly project by doing a series of videos, hopefully every Thursday, that deal with the theme of both the podcast episode and the newsletter theme. In keeping with the project, I don't know exactly what my rules are going to be, but essentially, here I am. So it's uh, afternoon, and I'm a little tired. I have been programming all day. I have to say that as I was getting ready to write the newsletter, I knew exactly what I wanted to say. And there was a bit of me that I think was literally honestly just tired enough to be like, just write it. See what happens. Well, honestly, there have been, I would say, I don't know how many. Actually, that'd be interesting for me to go back and look. This was number 106. I got so much positive, emphatic feedback from this issue, from this episode, whatever issue. And I think the reason was possibly due to the fact that I decided to not filter, not cash my the essence of what I wanted to say. Sometimes I, I compassionately think, oh, God, I better not say that, you know. And this week I really just didn't. And I'm really glad for it. I was a little concerned, to be honest. Because what my essential message is this week is that the things that we find useless are often those things that most make us human. Those things that are most essential to us being human. Those things that are the most useful for us to continue as a species. And it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Here we go. So as I was saying, I, and yeah, so the things that make us most human are considered often useless. And the first time that tweaked for me or whatever the, the, com, the phrase is, was while I was listening to that beautiful book, The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist. Uh, I found the quote that he referenced in his book. I found it in Wikipedia. And uh, it's a quote about and by my arch nemesis, Stephen Pinker, who is a Canadian living in the U.S., whereas I'm an American living in Canada. So that I don't think is a coincidence. I'm kidding. Anyway, I own all his books. I can't. I just, uh, he is, he is like my arch nemesis. If he says something, I can almost guarantee you that I believe the opposite. Anywho. This was referenced by Ian McGilchrist in The Master and His Emissary. And so I'm going to read from it and I'll do my best not to stare. Doing my best. Pinker compares music to auditory cheesecake. Stating that... As far as biological cause and effect is concerned, music is useless. Wikipedia article goes on to say that this is strongly rejected <laughs> by Daniel Levitin, Levitin, I don't know how to pronounce his name, and Joseph Carroll, experts in music cognition who argue that music has had an important role in the evolution of human cognition. And... In Wikipedia, there are six separate footnotes 
which all lead to articles that add credence to the case made by Daniel Levitt. Levitin and Joseph Carroll, who are again experts in that subject, whereas Steven Pinker is just some guy. Okay, that was unnecessary. <laughs> Steven Pinker is not just some guy. He's more highly, much more highly educated than I am. And I'm sure actually if I met him for coffee or over a beer, we'd have lots of things that we could commune about and things like this it's a bit i'm being a little silly but that made me really angry music's not useless and uh, you know i'd add to that a list of things a host of things that are the opposite of useless but for whatever reason we have decided not to nurture them in our current formation as a society and i find that odd I find it unnecessary, and I find it to be something that I, I would also say I'm confused. We're, we're pretty bright, you know, us humans, right? There are a few people who arguably, well, I know because I've, I mean, I've had a little bit of access to what people are able to do if they have enough capital in this capitalist society. And if you have enough capital, you really can do whatever you want. You don't lack for music. You know, you don't lack art. You don't lack access to nature. You don't lack a delicious, wonderful food with tons of nutrients in it, but also that's pleasing to the eye and fun to eat. You don't lack for leisure time. You don't lack for, yeah, deep, well, you might lack for deep, rich human, uh, human uh, relationships because you've Anyway, but you, you're not necessarily, your schools are, are clean and bright and, and fun to be in, right? Et cetera. All those things that are very useful, that are essential to being human, you have in our society if you have enough capital. Unfortunately, for some odd reason, the rest of us who, assuming this is a democracy, are having to sort of suck it up and not have as much, not have access to those things that are not just useful, essential to being human. I find that odd. The second little tweak to my consciousness that helped me contemplate usefulness and uselessness this last week was a podcast I listened to. The podcast is called, it's one of my favorites, Behind the Bastards. It's a podcast by Robert Evans. And yeah, I think, I think it goes along with my nature, which is to, I'm not sure how this works, but the more I confront and face the worst in humanity, weirdly, the more hopeful I get. Potentially, the more I decide to dig in my heels and dig in this compost I've been landed in, that I've landed in, and just try to get things to grow. <laughs> Maybe to counterbalance the shit. I don't know. But his late, his, one of his latest ep episodes dealing with, it was the part two of the Judge Rottenberg Center. I think that's the right name. Rottenberg. I don't think I'm saying that right because that's too easy. Anyway, the first quote is by, there's two quotes. The first one is by a woman named Nancy Weiss. She's an expert. I don't remember her exact position, but I can link to it somehow. It's quoted, she's quoted by Robert Evans in this episode, and she said, Part of the reason that people with disabilities have behavioral control, behavioral problems, behaviors that we find challenging, I love that turn of phrase, is that they're protesting the crappy lives we have offered them, she says, and then quote. It's that person's only form of protest, and it's a critique of the life being offered to them. She goes on to say, it's like there's no greater human impulse than to be in charge of your own life. 
and what JRC, Judd Rottenberg Center, does to an extent beyond what any other provider in this country does is to strip people of their choice and control. I wanted to preface the quote that I'm going to read by Robert Evans because what she said really encapsulates, I think, what Robert then riffed on later. If I'm not, maybe not, but that's what it seemed like to me. And I thought that was essential information. This is now a conversation between Robert Evans and his, the person that he asked on to the podcast for that episode named uh, Aiden Bonacci, who, man, I highly urge you to go in and listen to the two-part episode because a lot of what Aiden said was just brilliant. Brilliant. So much of the problem here. On the whole, all the state usually wants to do, and then it's sort of a pause and I ellipse, uh, took out a little bit. It's a mix. They're willing to devote more resources to the kids who will also be able to work a full time job. And like, quote, make a living, right? A lot of these kids, for whatever reason, aren't going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to live an economically productive life. And so the goal becomes, God, it's so hard not to cry through this. How do we warehouse these kids for the least amount of money? As opposed to, let this sink in. Is there anything we can do to give them a richer life? Aiden Bonacci replies, the full quote is, is excellent. You've got to go and listen to the whole thing. It's something we've seen time and time again, not just here. It's depressing and it's infuriating. Robert Evans goes on to say it is. And again, the villain here is the reduction of human beings to their pure economic potential. I would split hairs and say pure capitalist potential, but... <sighs> Interestingly, again, flipping back to the book I'm listening to, which is The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist, Ian says at one point, the model we choose to understand something determines what we find. And I think that is so apt for this situation exactly. If we're just trying to shut kids up, or adults, if we're just trying to warehouse them, if we forget for a minute that they're human, then I think that the things that we decide to do are going to be quite different than if we understand that in each case, whoever we're dealing with throughout our day is an actual human being, and those things that make that person human are, well, a consent-based relationship, access to art and music and nature, having control, having a say over what you do in your own life, I mean, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. It really isn't. What I realized, and especially now forwarding into the uh, podcast episode, is that we are, in a sense, often given lives and it I think at many times during our life, we have many epiphanies where we think, this doesn't feel right. This isn't quite right. And we then, we have to somehow become economically productive, don't we? And again, economically productive, I'd really like to split hairs and say capitalistically productive. We either have to figure out how to be a capitalist and own the means of production, or we have to figure out how to be a valuable source of labor right? And I think what ends up happening is that each, each time we're at that crossroads, 
and think about it. And I know in my own life, there's been several times, many times, where I've been at that crossroads. And the most ethical, moral thing to do is often what can also appear to be the most irresponsible thing. Choosing to care for people, for example. Choosing to develop the patience necessary to have a rich, collaborative relationship with those people. I have been, I have had to actually sort of use sutterfoot, what is that word? Be a little, I would say, deceitful sometimes when I'm saying, oh, what, when I'm trying to give reasons for why I've decided to do what I'm doing or whatever. It's been very awkward for many, many, many crossroads in my life when I'm in a fork in the road and I know that the moral, ethical thing to do is to take care of someone. Often for me, it's taking care of someone. I mean, I know personally some young people who are deeply interested in the arts and they're having to sometimes in some areas look irresponsible because of their choices. I find that appalling. I find it appalling. Sometimes I've noticed as well that we use expediency, efficiency, any number of excuses and rationalizations to avoid consent-based relationships, collaborative relationships. And I think it's to our detriment. I think it's odd that then we wonder why our kids, as they grow up, don't understand consent. I find it appalling. I understand, kind of, but I really don't, actually. Why we choose a non-consent-based relationships with the people around us. But... I think that it's to our detriment. I think that it is one of the main reasons that we can see that we're going in a direction that feels really kind of odd. The farther along we go, the odder it feels to many of us. We know that some schools, some public schools, are more like prisons than schools it's not like you you enter that those halls of learning and feel like oh wonderful i have so much choice and i can do whatever i want and i know that the person that's going to lead this class today and i know that the people the peers that are in this class are all going to understand human discourse and rich deep relationships and how to treat everybody with kindness and deep compassion and respect That's a rarity, isn't it? The only people I do know who have had that sort of acceptance in a school are people who are paying through the nose for that school, for that education, in one way or another. And I find that appalling. I find it appalling. I also find it kind of, like, obvious that when you strip from a person's life all the things that make them human, you're going to find a lot of mental disruption. Right? And I think that the way home is to start valuing those things that make us human. I mean, a consent-based culture, I, it was funny because in that conversation I realized in some ways, that there's this odd pushback about consent-based culture. I, I have consent-based relationships with everybody in my family, and it's not boring. It's not stilted. 
and we're not afraid of what it's the opposite because we've been we, because we've developed over many many years collaborative deep rich relationship we can say pretty much anything to each other and we know that a no is just a no it's not a rejection of the person completely and it is just the beginning of a conversation right and so to me that is deep and rich and human and the expediency and the efficiency that i've lost over the years potentially the gains that i've made in deep rich relationships i think are there's, there's you you can't even compare it so useful versus useless let's be useful let's be human let's drop those useless things as much as possible and again i'm going to quickly say something that i said in the last time i tried this one obviously we need to do some useless things to pay bills and such we do live in a capitalist society i'm not you know most of us can't just fuck off into the woods or whatever excuse my language right fair but let's try to fill our lives with as much useful human stuff as possible you know deep rich relationships music access to nature swimming in the cold cold water sometimes delicious food when we can some of the most inexpensive food is so delicious and healthy and nutritious and lovely etc i could go on and on make stuff create anyway thank you so much for your patience incremental continual improvement etc same as always see where this goes thanks so much take care <laughs>